Hello, everyone. Hello. Looks like we've got uh, a good amount of people joining here. We'll give people a few more seconds here to join and catch up. Um, but in the meantime, um, I am really, really excited to um, um, learn about um, Frosma, which is a, a great product that I've just been learning about over the past couple of weeks. Um, and today we're really going to be focusing on um, the idea of a composable uh, DXP. Um, so the idea there is the of having, you know, being able to pick and choose the sort of best of breed tools that are going to do um, what you needed to do. Um, and I'm very pleased and excited to uh, have a guest here, um, Maya Erkeke, which I hope I pronounced right. Was that better than the last time? That was perfect. Very okay. good job there. <laughs> good okay, job there. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, yeah. And so um, Maya here, um, she's actually, um, you know, one of the best best of the best in the personalization world, I would say. Um, she manages and develops a partner-driven uh, software business at Frosmo, um, and, which is an AI-driven personalization and recommendation engine. And um, I have to say, our customers uh, at Agility here are always asking us about like, hey, how do I do personalization? What do you recommend? So, um, you know, this is why we really wanted to have a session like this and bring on a partner like you guys to sort of, you know, help explain to the world of, you know, how you can use um, personalization um, in modern solutions. And, and so we'll talk about that a little bit today. So um, uh, Maya, um, why don't you take it away? Um, oh, actually, sorry, I completely forgot to introduce myself. I was so focused on, uh, on, on I was so focused on hyping you up that I forgot to introduce myself. So um, <laughs> for those of you who, who don't know me, my name is James Vidler. I am the uh, VP of customer solutions here at Agility CMS. So um, what I do is I, I work with all of our customers um, doing, uh, who are onboarding onto our platform, helping them find solutions to, uh, um, you know, uh, build successful solutions. And what I find really interesting is that, um, you know, the, the the sort of CMS world has changed a lot over the last several years. You know, there used to be back in the day where you'd have a sort of like a monolithic CMS that would have personalization built into it and all this other stuff, uh, e-commerce all in one big solution, which sounds good in theory, but the problem is, is like you are sort of forced into using things and you have vendor lock-in. Um, and now what a lot of our customers are asking us now is they want to cho choose the bits and pieces that they want to use and put them together. So. Um, that's what I do spend a lot of my job is, is, is actually researching these things and helping our customers find solutions to these. Um, so without further ado, um, Maya, why don't you take it away? Hey, thank you, James. Uh, it's really nice being here. Uh, a few words. So hello from Helsinki, Finland. I'm, uh, as James said, chief channel officer with Brasmo. I work with our partners, technology partners, resellers, implementation partners, and referrals. And I'm really excited to be here. I, I came across the concept of the headless CMS, the sort of composable architecture, maybe three years ago. And uh, it was actually one analyst, industry analyst, who said to me that, hey, take a look at this, uh, these vendors in the space of the headless CMS. I, I think you should really work with them. And it just made so much sense because exactly as James was saying, it, it very often is not a good solution to have one gigantic monolithic platform, but actually the bits and pieces and, and build them as you go. And that's why I'm, I'm really excited to be here and talk about personalization, because when in, in your implementation and on your journey for customer experience, you come across the bits of, of personalization, uh, then Frosmo is, is a good option for you. And I'll tell you today a little bit on like why personalize how it works and, and give you some, some good examples of, of what our customers have been doing and also we'll discuss the practicalities of how to get started. And so let me just show the agenda. So these are the topics we'll be going through today with James. So we'll talk about the, the use cases for personalization engine uh, and then of course the why. Why should you spend time on personalization? Uh, then I'll explain show some some practical like business cases that have been and build along different personalization use cases and then we'll talk a little bit about like getting started and then um, take a take a segue back to agility CMS and why headless architecture is actually really good for personalization 
podcast that really allows you to have this modular, modular content that can be easily targeted for different, different types of visitors. Uh, any comments, James, on the topics, topics of the yeah. day or should we get going? Yeah, well, actually, it's just, uh, just uh, one thing that um, um, I, I just a bit of an anecdote from speaking to our customers is that uh, everyone always wants to personalize. They're always like, I want to personalize this. I want to do this. Um, but one of the things that they always struggle to hone into is like the exact thing that they actually want to do. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Um, <laughs> And so I'm really curious to learn a little bit more about like the, uh, you know, the, the marketing customer experience use cases and the digital commerce use cases, because those are things that can really help um, people envision and imagine what they can do. Because I think that's one of the challenges people have with personalization is they're like, don't really quite understand what it can be used for. So I'm excited to see some of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, because that's also the most common, um, common comment or even objections we get from clients that personalization is this gigantic vague thing that I cannot really get hold of. How do I get started? So, so I'll give you some ideas on how to get started today. And then, of course, it's always good to sort of learn from the best and think like who's setting the bar. So um, if we look at Netflix or YouTube, so uh, I just actually checked that Netflix um, uh, has has informed or, or there's quite a bit of information that 80% of Netflix, Netflix views are from recommendations. So their recommendation engine is really driving what people are consuming. And uh, and same thing uh, with YouTube. Like if I look at the YouTube uh, on my, my kids' devices, I just see videos of other kids playing video games. And then when I look look at YouTube from my laptop, it's like, a lot of personalization and how to do retargeting or whatever. And it, it, it's totally a different different experience. And, uh, and uh, that's, I think, something we need to learn from. And, and that is something that people are getting used to. Uh, they like the fast and easy, find, like to find what they're looking for, but at the same time, get a bit of surprise. That's something new, something yeah. I, I didn't know I was looking for. I didn't know that this existed. Yeah, so that's, that's one of that's, yeah, that's one of my biggest complaints about like the at least the YouTube algorithm is like, you know, I I put YouTube on sometimes to, for my dog uh, to calm her down and she'll look at birds and animals and things, uh, which is great. But then my YouTube feed recommendations is now all these like dog videos <laughs> about <laughs> about like birds and squirrels and random <laughs> stuff like that. Like, like it'd be nice if YouTube realized like yeah, this is probably something that like he's going to search specifically for. I probably don't need to recommend these all the time. Like yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I never heard that one. I might, I might, you know, next time I'm showing this slide to someone, I'm going to use that. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, that's great. But if we then take it down to um, a website or e-commerce site, um, what, what are the actual use cases for personalization engines? And, um, and, um, I checked it actually just uh, while preparing for this. Um, I checked the latest Gartner personalization engine magic quadrant and they divide this uh, to three different use cases. So marketing use cases. I don't know if there are any marketers there, but hello to all of you. We know it's a, it's a tough, tough market and getting the message across is really difficult. So the first uh, uh, use case for marketers is, of course, showing the right content uh, for right people in the right channels. This might uh, be about advertising, but today we're talking on the context of a website or e-commerce site. And, and what every marketer wants uh, are their campaigns to be profitable. And just imagine you're spending a lot of money getting traffic to your website. And the worst case scenario is that that, that traffic is bouncing away immediately because they don't see anything relevant or you get to get that get the traffic to the site, but they don't convert or they don't want find what they're looking for. So I think the marketing use case is just really important in terms of showing the right content to right people, depending on what campaign they are coming from, for example. Yeah, then the digital it, commerce, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say for from, for, uh, for our own our own website at Julie to come. I know that's something that our marketing team always asks about too. Is like, how can we make sure that like if they come in from here, we show them this other stuff? Yeah, it's definitely a very common ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's a great comment because we have that one topic of the customer journey and how to personalize. And I was thinking of using your website as an example, <laughs> so we'll go through that. Right then, 
how we can we can talk about on, on the practical level. Uh, then the digital commerce use case is, is the one we've all seen. So you know the product recommendations. Hey, people who bought this also bought, or you might like this product, or a a promotion tailored offer just for you. And uh, where I see more and more focus, and why I think it's it's really interesting um, speaking speaking now to uh, Agility CMS is this tailored content. So I see with a lot of our commerce clients uh, that the role of content is growing because it's good for SEO, it's good for the brand, it's good for the experience, and just um, it's not just promoting a product, but also promoting the correct content for each visitor. And then the last use case is around the service and support. I, I love this term of reducing customer effort, like making things fast and easy, uh, delivering the brand experience on the digital side as well, just uh, making, making it feel smooth and at the same time uh, brand aligned with your brand promise. So these are the, the use cases. And toward the end, when we talk about how to get started, uh, the first thing you want to think about is that, okay, which one of these use cases do I want to start with? I think all of them are valuable. It depends on your business. Business, uh, what do you want to start with? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So uh, if we then move on to uh, why personalize, um, we've just had this new customer coming to us and saying that, hey, I'm just renewing my website, but I cannot fit everything to the front page that should be on the front page. And, and that, that's really the point, that you have these people. Um, here we have samples of people, and, and um, they, uh, in this case, can be anonymous, even though now we're talking about personas, so these folks actually have names. Uh, but, but we are talking about these anonymous audiences that you're talking to, not necessarily uh, people uh, like your individual customers, which then we integrate to the customer data platform or CRM of, of the of our customer. But but how do I how do I make my front page relevant for everyone? You know, every single one of these uh, these personas is busy. Uh, they are impatient when they come to the site. They want to find the relevant thing immediately. So I see per personalization as sort of like mass customization of your website that you show the right thing to the right people at the right point of their journey. And, um, and that's how you then can kind of help them forward and, and help them find whatever they are looking for. What, what, what do you, James, think of this? Any, have you had any trouble with your website in terms of like what contents get to, gets to be where? Yeah, well, I think, uh, um, I, I don't believe we have any sort of exact personalization on our own website right now. I know our marketing would, would love to have something like that, but we sort of try to manually sort of like be like, okay, if you're this kind of person, click on this thing and then we'll take you to this section of the site and have that content sort of separated by persona. But it's very much like, we hope this person comes in and clicks the right thing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I think that's yeah. a very, very good point. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, pe people never do that. <laughs> it's, not, yeah. it's not a straightforward workflow that they would click what you want them to click. But people click around and they go check out other websites and learn somewhere else and then they come back. And then you, again, you should catch them. <laughs> and uh, I mean, so much time is spent on website uh, renewal projects on deciding like, okay, what should be on the hero banner? Whose business gets the best position on the site? I mean, that just, uh, I, I don't even want to imagine how much time <laughs> you spend on different projects for that before personalization helped solve that problem, because we know that, hey, this slot is actually for the relevant content and the right business gets that content when, when the right person is entering the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I know from, yeah. from, our, from, our, from our side too, it's like when someone comes to the site, like, you know, for, for us, like we have a persona of like a, who, a developer or like a content editor mm -hmm. and, and like, we might know that a person goes and like, you know, looks at some developer articles, but we have no way of sort of like attributing that person's session to like, oh yeah, okay, this person's a developer now. That's just completely still anonymous. So it's it's hard for us to understand what people are, mm -hmm. actually, what yeah, people's yeah. personas actually are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly why you why you have a personalization engine for. So if we now go a bit bit deeper into 
like what are the different data points and, and parameters that can be used. So uh, this is an example of sort of highlighting it that now we are talking about an anonymous website visit. We don't know who they are, uh, but there are a lot of things we know. So we have the data about that specific visitor. We have the data about the other visitors and the context. For example, the page type, the, the category, uh, the exact page they are on. That's all contextual information that can be utilized um, to, to deliver the individual experiences. And if we go through these different parameters really quickly, uh, sort of location, weather, time of the day uh, can be really helpful. We have, for example, as a customer, one utility company who is doing this weather and location-based um, personalization because uh, they have uh, they have a problem that when there is a storm on the areas uh, that they serve, that actually might cause some power outages in, in that region. So they have a personalization that they are tracking this uh, weather weather data from these uh, free weather APIs, and then using that as a personalization rule that the, when there is wind over, now I can't remember the, the trigger for wind, that much wind or rain in certain region, that's actually automatically triggering the personalized messages on the website for all the visitors coming from that region mm -hmm. to the site. And uh, it has helped the marketing team so much because earlier they actually had to get up middle of the night when they saw that there's a storm, a middle of the night, you know, change the website <laughs> and wow. make sure that wow. uh, it has the hero banner that, hey, if you get hit by the storm, this is what you do. Well, it's it's really interesting yeah. to see like to think about how those different data points can be used to influence certain things. I mean, like another way to look at that too is like, hey, if it's raining, you know, and I'm selling and I'm a clothing store, maybe I'm gonna highlight like rain boots or like rain jackets. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a very good example, and and that works in the in the outdoor clothing business really well. So we have one customer who's in the kids outdoor clothing uh, business. And uh, at least like on this part of the world, uh, as parents, we always get surprised by the first freezing cold morning. You know it's coming, but then when it comes, you realize that, okay, my kids, you know, their gloves are too small, their jackets are too small, and then you go online ordering. And so what these guys are doing, they're using the weather that, okay, now it's gonna be freezing, so let's push all this winter gear and uh, make sure that all the campaigns are aligned on the site. So that's a great, great example. Um, then other ones are, of course, uh, the behavior patterns of that specific person, which obviously is one data point. Uh, then for the marketers, as we talked about the marketing use case, so the campaign, uh, search engine marketing, email marketing, uh, those are good data points because people coming from a certain campaign sort of expect your site to be aligned with the campaign. Because that's sort of a big a mismatch and, and loss of marketing money. If you run a campaign, people come to your website and then the site, it's like the, the message on the site is not aligned with your campaign at all. And then of, of course we have the magic word of, of AI. So the, uh, we are predicting the current needs and intents of that specific visitor. And, and one last thing and something that we've focused on a lot over the last 12 months, let's say during the pandemic, is this fast and easy part. So really deploying Frosma to the site, of course, depends a bit on the, the standards you're using. Are you using Google's enhanced e-commerce data layer? Uh, but we deploy Frosma very fast to the site and then you start seeing the impact on your business KPIs immediately. And, and that's the nice thing about personalization is that calculating the business case is quite straightforward. There's a check from your Google Analytics that, okay, that's my Frosma segment, that's my other traffic, let's see how they are performing. And uh, you can always see if, if the personalization works and how well it works and, and does it work on certain pages better than others. Um, while you're on the topic of AI, we actually have a, a question here from the chat from um, Aishika. Um, saying, uh, how do we harness the capabilities of AI in the most optimal manner, respecting the privacy of the consumers? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a great question. And um, obviously, uh, all the data that we are using is, is anonymous. 
So you could not identify the person based on that data. And, and also, uh, obviously, the, the, let's say the cookie content policies or the content management is a, is a bit different. But we basically, of course, connect to the content management of your site. And then personalization is only, only applied for the visitors who actually allow it. But I would say being anonymous, using these data points that are available to us without knowing who the, who the actual person is. And then just to follow up, uh, I think this is probably more specific to your platform, but uh, the question there, is it encrypted, the actual data that you guys store on, on, on these users? Uh, I would probably I, I don't know all the details, honestly, how. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I guess somehow it's encrypted. I, I don't have the exact no, technical details on that. But yeah. Great question. Do you have other questions? Uh, I think that's it for now. I think we can move on. Uh -huh. All right. Let's 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 move forward. Move forward. So um, now when we start with the first use case example, now you kind of have an idea that we have these different data points. And how would you use them for a marketing use case? So I don't know if, if any tele, uh, anyone working for a teleoperator is there, but that's actually really complex business because you have your consumer clients, you have your B2B clients, and then you have the, the business of the Excel subscriptions, but then you often have devices, you have your corporate communications, and you have, might have one website serving all those audiences. So we have uh, quite a few uh, teleoperators as clients. This was just a two-week test uh, where they wanted to use this uh, AI-driven optimization for hero banners, and they actually almost tripled uh, their click-through rate. And you can imagine if a person comes to the website, instead of bouncing away, they actually click the relevant hero banner, they move forward on their journey, they find the relevant, con uh, relevant content or relevant products for them. Uh, extremely valuable. These guys just did a two-week test, uh, said that, hey, it works, great, uh, now it's something that's live all the time. So they were doing A-B testing with the comparison group, but now it's live on the site all the time. So really practical marketing use case. If you don't know what to start with, start with your hero banner. Yeah, I think that's actually just great general advice is like, don't think of first stage agents like, I need to personalize everything across my site. No, just start off small. Just like do like one little area on your on your homepage or, or, or mm -hmm. on a certain page that you want to experiment with. I think that's a great approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, if we then move forward, uh, let's see if we can. Uh, James and I had a discussion about this slide. James was like, yeah, a lot of info. Are you sure you want to show that? May, yeah, I, maybe. Let's try it. OK, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. No. Uh, this is something that um, shows that uh, customer journeys are not straightforward. Like you cannot tell your website visitors that, hey, click here, click here, click here, convert. It, it, that's not how people work. So, so here's an example. And there you see three sessions. So it is um, session one, session two, session three. Then on top of the slide, actually you see different page types, which represent different contexts. So we have front page. We have customer references page. Uh, we have a landing page or e-commerce solution page. Uh, then we have some resource page. And then we have actually e email workflows. So, so this is something um, we actually uh, tested, tested for a, a client when we started thinking that, OK, if somebody lands, um, this was sort of a system integrator who, who as one of their solutions had e-commerce. And they wanted to do personalization for this audience interested in e-commerce. And uh, the first thing, we'll start here with the search part. As you can see there on top, like a lot of web visits start with search. So James, if you take the first personalization use case here, is that I land on the page uh, with the search. You click one forward, so we should see the first oh, I see, personalization. Yeah. So I land here on the page. So Frosma knows that I'm interested in e-commerce. And now my browser is tagged. So, so basically, I'm now segmented as someone who's interested in e-commerce. That's the first data point for Frosma. Uh, what happens then is that every single one of these page, pages have a slot for dynamic personalized content. So like if you've been to the references page of, of any system integrator or, 
or software vendor, you know that there are tons of references and it's difficult to find the one you're looking for. But now we know this person is interested. So if you James take the next one, uh, the next personalization thing is obviously highlighting the e-commerce cases. Because the Prosmo AI is saying that, hey, that's the affinity, we'll highlight these e-commerce cases for this person. And uh, as, as all, at least marketers know that people come and go. You know, they leave your site, they compare, they might go to competitors' websites, and then they come back. And they often then actually come back to your homepage. And here you see as the third um, personalization here, uh, case here is relevant front page highlighting e-commerce content. So when I come to the homepage, it's not that sort of generic corporate story, but it is, there is a slot for the e-commerce content because the site knows that that's what I'm actually interested in. And, and that's the uh, free tip for everyone here. If I want you to remember one thing from this webinar, like the lowest hanging fruit, it is the front page personalization for your returning visitors because you know what they're interested in and, and they are there on purpose. I mean, they're probably not on the side for the fun of it. So, so really like serving them with something relevant, it's, it's an easy business case. That's like mm -hmm. a win every single time. Uh, and then, um, you know, as I'm browsing the site, uh, then I see my e-commerce content on all of these, on the dynamic slots. So that's what I recommend, that you always have your sort of fallback website, but then you have one slot or two slots dedicated for the dynamic content. And that seems to be, work well with the consistent experience, but at the same, same time showing something relevant. And then you can always link your personalization with your email workflows. That if I come to the site from an email, I'm really interested. And again, uh, I may, might get some other, other tailored content. Oops. So a lot of info on this, uh, on this uh, page, but it also highlights the reality of the customer's journey which very rarely is like step one two. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm trying to i'm actually working on a new documentation site um and all the different sort of where i had a big discussion with some people on my, on my team about how people you know browse content and find things and the answer is everyone has different ways to do to find things exactly some people prefer searching <laughs> some people for browsing that's yeah yeah there's no uh, there's no exact science to that one yeah yeah and, and, and I think that's perfect. That's like the beauty of it. Okay, so that's where some, some examples, now we're moving forward really fast, fast. but if you can uh, go. Oh, did, yeah, I, this uh, one? did I skip over? Yeah, but, no, this is perfect, perfect. Yeah, okay, got it. So here's actually a screenshot uh, from our own website. And we are obviously trying to, <laughs> to actually do what we're, we're telling customers to do. So here's uh, something which is a, a content recommendation. So, so this is one of our solution pages. And there on the lower right-hand corner, you see most popular content. And uh, we've selected three recommendation strategies here. So others also read, uh, trending content, and then you recently viewed. And, um, and James, if you had to guess, like what is it that people click? If you have this sort of content elevator on the homepage, mm. uh, which one of these strategies do you think gets most clicks on most of our customer sites? Well, I mean, you mean like when would they just click the sort of the, the the top thing that pops up on the on the, on the list there? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Because now yeah. the the strategies we're using, we have one social proof, so others also viewed. We have a statistical one, which is trending content. And then we have something that's for me, my recently uh, viewed content. So which one of these do you think gets most clicks? Oh, probably. I'm sorry, it's an unfair quiz. I didn't tell you no, that there's going to be a quiz. Uh, I mean, like, I probably others also read. Like, Yeah, that, that's what I, I thought. Yeah. And it works if it's like a blog. It works yeah. really well. But it, when you're on the home page, it's surprising how often it is you recently viewed. Oh, wow, interesting. People if, just go back to what they've already seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, unless, of course, it's a news site where you always yeah. go for new content. But, but for a lot of websites, um, diff very different industries, uh, it's actually people want to go back to or like pick up where they left off. And same applies to e-commerce. It's, it's crazy how many clicks actually 
um, go to the, the product you recently viewed. So I think our lives are just so full of interruptions or we want to compare <laughs> options or I don't know, educate more. But that's, that's another like a free tip that help your visitor pick up where they left off. It's, it's yeah. surprising how often they want to do that. All right. So now let's right. dive into some, uh, some digital commerce cases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Need to be conscious of the time. So I, I think we need to skip over a few slides, but they're going to sure. be in the material. So, so you well, guys you, can, can you let that. me know you drive, I click. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're doing great job. I think this is working very well. Um, so um, then again, we look at the, the business case. So in e-commerce, like calculating the business case for personalization is, is really straightforward because you have, have like two variables. You have your conversion rate and you have your average order value. And, and then you calculate that, okay, what is the range? Where does this business case make sense? So if a customer asks me that, okay, what can you always promise? So typically I say that, okay, let's start with 10 and 10. If you get a 10% increase on your conversion rate and 10% on your average order value, does that validate the business case? The, typically it does. Um, sometimes, depending on if you already have some recommendations, um, it, it might be, you know, it, one of these might be lower, one of them might be higher. If there is no personalization, then they are typically higher. But, right. but when you do the math, if you have, let's say, 2 million monthly visitors, and, and your conversion rate goes up 23% and average order value 14%, it's, it's really, really significant mm -hmm. business impact. So and that's the nice thing it, about this business. Yeah, actually, but it's interesting you, you point this out here because it, I mean, if, if you're like a small business and you're not selling very many things, it's probably worth noting that, you know, adding personalization probably isn't going to dramatically increase any, uh, in, increase your, your conversions are really the, the bottom dollar. Mm. But when you have volume, that's when you really start to see those those enormous gains. Mm. Correct. Correct. Um, if we move forward to I uh, want to introduce to the, the a bit more on the customer journey part. So for us, a lot of customers obviously do A-B testing and they validate that is, is Prosmo worth it. And we get typically very good results. Uh, we get the best, best business results over any competition. And uh, my opinion is that one of the reasons is the thinking of the customer journey. So on the next slide, you'll see how, how the journey would impact the Frostmos, for example, recommendations. But when you think of going to any brick and mortar store, nothing is there by random. And, and same should apply to e-commerce. So whatever you see there, it should not be random. It should be targeted for you. So here's a great example. Uh, I love riding, riding my bike. I have to say that now during the pandemic, at least uh, here in, in Europe, it has almost been difficult getting, buying a bike because they've been like out of stock <laughs> on like yeah, all these too. normal models. <laughs> same, same there as well. But um, in, in the world where you actually can buy a bike online, here's a sample of, of how Frosma would work. So when we think of the customer journey, if you please click once, we see the journey, uh, the basic phases of a customer journey, buying something. You have your discovery, you have your selection, and you have your upsell. Uh, and when I enter the site, let's say it's a site that is selling bicycles, you typically, first thing that Frostma would be showing are the most popular items from different categories, because Frostma doesn't know what I'm interested in. If you know James, make one click. So when, when the visitor is making their first click, what Frosmo actually starts identifying is the primary affinity. So what is this person interested in? Is it certain type of bike, uh, certain brand or, or a category? And then the recommendation engines uh, starts sort of showing uh, recommendations based on the affinity. And as the visitor moves on on their journey, when you sort of then are converting, you've kind of selected your bike, then, in my opinion, comes the part which is also good customer service, so building the complete package. So if it is the type of bike that uh, record, where you would need mud guards, uh, it's like really bad service if the site is not offering those. But mm -hmm. at least that's the case over here. We just bought the bike for a family member a year ago, and when it arrived, we realized that there were no mud guards. 
and it's like okay the site would have made more business we would have been happier <laughs> if those were offered so it was like lose lose and uh and then what Frasma does is is really aligns the recommendation strategy to the the context so the page type the face of the journey and the affinity and and that's the beauty of it that really creates then this win-win experiences where where uh, purchasing anything is easy and then at the same time you also get the ancillaries if you're buying a expensive bike then those clip-on shoes or windproof jacket is, is no big deal and then obviously toward the end uh the recommendation engine recommends something similar what you would see by the cashier in a in a store so um that's uh the e-commerce use case that we sort of typically typically start with uh, so you would implement these uh, recommendations on different different page types e-commerce is is in that sense quite straightforward because uh, we have industry specific blueprints and uh, that tend to work with all sites mm -hmm. yeah and, and you and frostba has a concept of actual products in your system too is that right yeah yeah correct and and when thinking of of content i always tell people that hey if it's a content site, your content is your product. I mean, right. you've invested time and effort creating mm -hmm. that content. It should be yeah. treated like a product. It shouldn't be something that's like left to sit in the CMS in case somebody finds it, but right. really being treated and, and promoted equally as products. Right. All right. Um, how are we with the schedule? I guess we can. Uh, we've got about, uh, you know, 15 minutes left. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, are there are some slides here that you that you want to skip or yeah let's go through this quickly uh, you sure. can take a look at them afterwards in in the follow up material these are best practice tips so um, if if you just um, show some of the points there so for the front page what I already mentioned what you definitely want to explore is the hero banner so your dynamic hero banner either entire hero carousel or something like a split hero works really really well. Uh, then uh, you want to be showing something best performing offer or content for the segment and uh, then always also probably something surprising so something uh, optimizing for a, a surprise content or a promo or offer and, and then you can do your recommendation strategies according to the space and affinity so a lot of options don't do everything at once, but these are <laughs> yes. ideas you want to explore with. And uh, I, I'm a big believer in data, so always do A-B testing and check what actually works works with your visitors. Yeah, I can't stress that enough. Start off small. Don't try to take on too much at once. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then the other one, uh, I think we can look at this, these points as well at once. So we have some samples. So if we talk about e-commerce, uh, one really important advice I have for you is make sure that your product page is not at a dead end because it's not the right product for everyone who lands on that page. So you want to make sure that there is inspiration. Um, then especially situations if the product is out of stock, you want to make sure that you're immediately recommending an alternative and having something relevant for the visitor to continue with because otherwise they're just going to bounce away and uh here are some some product recommendation strategy samples that would work really well on on product pages but you can sort of take a take a deeper look at this i'd see uh, a trend if you just think of like how many different uh product recommendation strategies do you have on the product page so i see the trend earlier it was okay just one maybe two now i see some of retailers even experimenting with like three three rows of product recommendations with with a bit of different strategies and and based on the preliminary a b testing results i've seen that seems to work so actually having lots of options uh, seems to work for a lot of, a lot of use cases mm -hmm. yeah i've i've worked with customers a lot with uh, building e-commerce sites and um, the recommended product section has always been a, 
uh, a challenge because they haven't actually introduced any sort of personalization systems. So what they've essentially done is they've like tagged pro they like tag products with common tags. And then like when you have a product that'll show related products by the tags. Um, mm -hmm. And that works, but it takes a lot of manual maintenance, if you will, <laughs> to determine sort of what tags to use, make sure people don't, you know, don't set the wrong tags. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, when you're dealing with thousands of products, that becomes really hard to manage over time. Yeah, I think that's a great point, which I haven't really discussed is just saving the time, like saving yeah. time for the marketer or e-commerce manager by knowing that, okay, this section of each page is always up to date. It's dynamic. It's, it's run by the recommendation engine. I don't need to worry about it. It's yeah. always a pain, pain for a customer when in our update meetings, they notice that, oh, oh no, that part of the site is not up to date. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, uh, definitely helping solve that problem. Hey, I've talked a lot about A-B testing. So just to clarify, if, if somebody hears about multi-arm bandit or MAB or bandit testing, so they're on the sort of on the on the lower so lower uh, left-hand corner, you see this uh, this little chart that is um, has this title MAB, and that's actually something an algorithm driven optimization where all you need to do is select like how aggressive do you want the algorithm to be and then that's automatically optimizing which variant gets most displays and then it's testing the others as well every now and then uh, but then really the, the the variation that has the best performance gets most displays and that works well when you don't want to be doing a traditional a b test for example you have a campaign and, and you just have a very short limited time. So you don't want to be running the A-B test throughout the campaign, but you actually want to go for the best performing variation right. as soon as. Possible. So it's so it's kind of like a, almost like a dynamic A-B test that sort of starts off yeah, as an A-B test initially, good. and then yeah. and then depending on which one gets clicked on more, that one gets shown more. Is that, am I mm -hmm. right in that understanding? Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, because I have to say, I, I'd never heard of the term uh, multi arm yeah. bandit earlier. I was looking at some of yeah. uh, the docs the other day, and I was like, "What is the, what is that?" Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just just some some concepts still in there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think you explained it better than I did. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, we're pretty much running out of time. So so getting getting started. Uh, if you can skip through that until the slide, that's we can go. But um, if you can go to the previous one, because oh, this yeah. is really. Uh, about the why why the headless CMS mm -hmm. is is so perfect. So when you start doing personalization, you define your who, who's the audience, when do I want them to see something, where do I want it to be, and what it is. And that's the beauty of it. When you have a headless CMS, you actually have your modular content, and it's easy through their APIs to actually pull the content from the CMS. You don't need to do any like content duplication in in your CMS. So I think, I don't know the agility story uh, as well as James does. So I think I'm going to hand this over to yeah. you and you can talk a bit about agility and how your content um, and the model fits with this personalization. Yeah, I, can, I can speak to that. So maybe one moment here. I'm just going to switch, switch up what I'm sharing here. Yeah, so um, thanks for that. Um, this is a very quick, quick uh, things that I just wanted to cover here um, in, as it pertains to the CMS. Um, because everything we've sort of covered here so far is like, you know, personalization and what you can sort of do in Frosmo um, and, and the different ways you can do that. Um, and it's important to note, like you don't, you don't need a CMS to use Frosmo by, by any means. Um, but there are common challenges that come up um, you know, if you're not using a CMS or if you don't have a CMS that's sort of like integrated well with your personalization engine, such as Frosmo. So some of the common challenges that a lot of our customers have is that, um, um, you know, a lot of personalization engines have, uh, you essentially need to create content in the personalization engine so that the personalization engine knows about your content. So they end up, customers end up creating content that's in that engine which is now completely disconnected from their actual um, main content, right? Um, so what ends up happening is they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna take a product, for example, right? You might like create a product in, 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 in Frosmo um, with certain structured properties and categories and tags and stuff like that. Um, 
And then you might also go into your CMS and also create that same product because you need to render that product on your website and you want to be able to grab that. Um, so it ends up having people either end up duplicating the content in two different places, which obviously is not ideal, especially if you have lots of lots of products. Um, or what ends up happening is they end up trying to hacking the hack the sort of personalization engine to become their CMS. So they sort of rely on um, um, on on the personalization engine to actually um, you know create the data and and also provide the data through an API. Um, and you know Frostman has APIs for that. Like you can create products and you know, get the product details and things directly. You could use it actually as a, as a CMS, but um, this goes back to the sort of the DXP concept, right? Like, you know, Frozen was not focused on being a, you know, a content management system. They have much, you know, much different fish <laughs> to, to fry in the personalization space, and they need to focus on what they do best. Um, similar to agility, we need to focus on what we do best, which is, al you know, allowing people to create um, content and easily access it. Um, so, um yeah you you we want to keep uh you want to use the tools that that fit best uh, for what you're trying to do so when you're creating it if you create an integration between the cms and your um and your personalization engine where you know people the idea there is that content editors should be able to go and create content and then you know auto magically <laughs> you know frosmo knows about that content already so you shouldn't have to go into two different places mm -hmm. and the great yeah. part about that is that you can have a separation of concerns and workflows so content editors can be in the cms whereas you know someone who's maybe you know managing sales on the e-commerce side or someone who's sort of more specialized in the personalization side of things can manage how those experiments and things work actually within uh, within frosmo so you're not sort of having like you know editors and people working personalization in the same place your you know separate teams that obviously will collaborate together, but you have a better separation of concerns that way. Um, and then the sort of last thing I want to talk about here is just sort of like uh, illustrating that a little bit. So you know the sort of general architecture of you know what something like this might look like, right? So you've got the three different sort of roles of people that are sort of involved in this. You've got your content creator, which is going to be uh, in the CMS. In, in this case, that would be Agility. Um, you've got the uh, sort of e-commerce and optimization team or, or role, and those people would be in Frosmo. Um, and then you've got the actual developers that are building your website. Um, they're not necessarily going to need to be in any of them. <laughs> they're just going to build the, uh, the the development platform. And yes, they will need to understand the you know how to use the Frosmo APIs. They will need to understand how to use the Agility APIs and things too. Um, but it really sort of separates out those, that that separation of concerns that I was talking about earlier. Um, and uh, and so here, you know, the CMS is really this is where all the content's created. Frosmo is where all the where all of the the rules happen. Um, developer builds it and integrates with both of them. And then as a visitor, you visit the website and you're none the wiser. Uh, you you don't know there's a CMS behind the scenes. You also don't necessarily know that Frosmo is behind the scenes. Um, and you get all those benefits of um, getting recommended content and uh, the content that is that is right for you. Great. So Great. yeah. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so in terms of, uh, in, at least I'll go over the sort of next steps here from, from the agility standpoint. If you are curious about, uh, you know, just using agility or if agility is new to you, um, please check out our website, agilitycms.com. Um, also reach out to me on Twitter, at James K. Riddler, um, or join our Slack community and uh, ask questions and join our community there. And um, I also know that um, uh, you had a slide here as well for, um, for our contact info. Yeah, for your contact info. I, I think it's, it's coming up. I can say that we are uh, off the social media platform, so definitely most active on, on LinkedIn. So all of our latest and greatest stuff is, is on LinkedIn. You can check our website. And, and if you want to see how this uh, content personalization works, you can check the website and the recommended content part or most popular content part, and, and you can check it out there. And, you know, there's my email, phone number, you can reach out to me or especially LinkedIn. I would say I'm most active on, on LinkedIn. Nice. And I'm just going to check the chat here as well and see if there's any sort of uh, questions here we may be able to answer here while we've got a few minutes left here. So, um, oh, there's actually quite a few questions here. So, 
Oh, there's actually some more like uh, security questions here that uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer necessarily, but are good questions just to talk about in general conversations mm -hmm. to have. But how do privacy yeah. and consumer data considerations like GDPR and CCPA um, affect reaching more accurate personalization? Um, I know you had mentioned earlier that you know all mm -hmm. that data is is anonymized. So mm -hmm. um, I think at least in my understanding is that uh, as long as that data is anonymized, then it actually doesn't need to fall under GDPR. But I, I could be wrong about that. I'm I'm not a, I'm not an expert. Yeah, I, I think um, we've actually done sort of an episode on, on consent management. So I'd say that the consent management is sort of the foundation. You need to let the consumer know what the data is that you're tracking and, and how you're using it. And we're definitely, you know, compliant, compliant with those regulations and, and can discuss those in more detail. I don't think we have time to really dig deeper. And yeah. of course, I'm not an expert on every single point, but can give you an example on how our customers use it if, if you want to discuss in more details. But it's really important. I think it's a fine line, personalization and privacy. They are like, uh, you, it's, it's like a balancing act in a way. And I, I think you need to allow the, the visitors and the consumers to feel safe about the data. Um. And there's another question here says, can the conversions, can increasing conversions also come from extensive UI and UX change to an application? And they're saying, are those more effective than, um, you know, personalization conversions? That, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. I think, let, let's put it this way. I think we need to test that. <laughs> so let's, let's test it. I, uh, I honestly don't have an immediate answer to that. I, I'd say both. It depends on where you start. And we have a slide, I have a slide in the deck with start your, your why. Like, why do I want to start this? And, and you know, your standard, write your hypothesis and, and get started. I think it depends on the baseline. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's a, that, that is a pretty loaded, loaded question to, to answer. And, you know, of course, you know, changing UIs and things can certainly help drive conversion and things. But yeah. I think another way to look at it is testing out different UIs. Right, mm -hmm. testing out how how different things can look different, and you could actually use a personalization engine like Frosmo to actually do some stuff like that, where it's like, hey, um, you know, for example, you you could in in theory have like uh, two completely different versions of your homepage, right? Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. could use you know Frosmo maybe to do one of those um, MAB tests. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go. Uh, remind me what yeah. that acronym stands for again. Yeah, multi arm bandit. <laughs> yes. Uh, multi arm yeah. bandit, um, yeah. where you could actually like show just like test out a bunch of different ones and see which one actually becomes more popular over time. Um, so you could we do something like that. We actually have some clients who uh, they talk about hypothesis driven development, and that's what they do. They they use Frostma to test the new mm. UI and maybe only show it to let's say twenty percent of the traffic, and then when it works, uh, that's actually put through the backlog and uh, mm. as a as a regular. UI improvement. So I don't think it's one or the other. I think they work together. Yeah, uh, I know. I know for sure uh, on the agility side, our product team has used that to um, test out different UI updates as well. Um, where we've sort of used a, a personalization engine to be able to exactly, look, but like you said, you know, show one UI versus another UI, and they have a certain goal in mind. They're like, okay, we want someone to use this feature from mm -hmm. start to end. Let's show them two different flows or two different ways of getting there and see which one actually works best. Yeah. Um, because you know it, it's it's sometimes it's really hard to make a decision you know if you're if you're managing the ui for something it's like what is actually the best thing to do because you're going to have yeah, all these stakeholders yeah. and things that are going to have their own opinions of what they think exactly. should be on there and um you know those discussions can be never ending sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> and so sometimes a good solution to that is okay well let's do both and we'll see which one wins yeah yeah and we have a lot of customers who do exactly that because they have these endless discussions on what should be on the hero banner yeah. Watch it be here and watch it today. Yeah, very good use case. Okay, great. Well, I think that's uh, I think that's it for the sort of questions that we have right now. And I do want to apologize for some of the technical difficulties we had earlier, but um, um, you know, hopefully it wasn't, it wasn't too disruptive. <laughs> yeah, that's always part of the deal. I was I was yes. just posting on LinkedIn before we started that you're always a bit nervous before a live session, but now you can see it was a live session, wasn't pre-recorded. <laughs> No, nope, definitely not. Alive. And uh, uh, um, I felt like I was kind of playing one of those games where have you ever, have you ever heard of one of those those games where you sort of like you're presenting a slide deck, but you actually don't know what the slides are until you see the slide. <laughs> no, uh, I would so, not play uh, that. 
So oh yeah, I was I was at a, I was at a, I was at a conference and um, they had that sort of as like a, one of the happy hour things that they had where they said they had these sort of pre canned slides and they would ask people to go up and present these slide decks without them knowing anything about what was actually on the slide. So they would see the slide and then have to just sort of make something up uh, as you go. It wasn't exactly like that, but I kind of felt like that when I was presenting your slides. I was kind of like looking at the slides, being like, okay, well, there's like some blank space over here, so I'm pretty <laughs> sure something's gonna pop up if I click the next button. <laughs> yeah, it, it was very good. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think it. Uh, I think we recovered okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we recovered. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, Maya, for coming on. Uh, we really appreciate it. Hopefully, we can uh, we can stay in touch and have you guys back again. And um, you know, for anyone who's watching this, again, if you're interested in Julia Frosno, please check us out. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.